Welcome again, saints. It is your dearest servant, Brother Pastor Brian Dell of the St. Mark Baptist Church. Hey, let me pray for us, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, uh, we just thank you for gathering one more time. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this season uh, that we find ourselves in, Lord, both uh, with remembrance of your son, especially, Father, but moreover, Lord, in the season of lessons and training, Lord, and preparation and anointing, Lord, that you have us in in this season. Uh, Lord, as we go forward in this lesson, Lord, I ask, Lord, that you just open our eyes and ears, Lord, but most of all, Lord, so our spirits, Lord, can be, our spirits can just be fertile planting or fertile ground for the planting of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, today, saints, is lesson four, December 26, 2021. And we find ourselves in um, the unit once as well, and God requires justice. And what we're talking about today is the consequences of justice. And just a brief review, I'll just go back just a few lessons, I think, to December 12th. And what we found out uh, on lesson two is it was called the mercy of justice. And what we learned was that there is a way that even if God puts the ability to bring forth his justice in your hand that you need to deal with people and have mercy on people. Now, as we learned in that lesson, there was David and Mephizabeth. Mephizabeth was a son of Jonathan, who was David's good friend and uh, close allies. And it, that must have been what that scripture who said, there is a friend that stick closer to a brother, uh, that will stick closer than a brother. That must be what that scripture meant. Um, with, with the respect to the, less, the legacy and the relationship of David and Jonathan, because they were very close, although Jonathan's father saw, obviously sought always to kill David and to harm David out of a jealous spirit. So what we found out is that after the death of Saul, David became king. And obviously, Jonathan died at the same time that his father did. And but Mephizabeth was, you know, he was kind of he had he was had a handicap. But the bigger picture is that David actually sought Mephizabeth, the son of Jonathan, out not only to keep his word, but to show the mercy of justice. Because, again, we think of justice as something that is negative, something that has to happen if somebody simply breaks a law. But again, justice as well as honoring one's pledge. Now, I can make that philosophical argument. It takes seven or eight minutes to make that philosophical argument, but I'm going to trust your intelligence, obviously, in order to understand what I'm saying. So justice does, isn't only delivered with the battle axe. You see, justice is also delivered in grace and it's delivered in mercy. And what I mean by that is I don't always, you know I'm not some teacher. Uh, those of you Sunday school students and certainly you, the St. Mark Baptist Church, you know that I'm not one of these teachers that's going to tell you that the Bible teaches us always to turn the other cheek. That is not true. Again, that is another lie from the pit of hell. Uh, again, when we talk about doctrinal imperatives or those things that are we believe are commandments and they're true 100% of the time, we have to first measure it against, obviously, the Holy Spirit's guidance, but we also have to measure it against the season God has us in. Remember, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, for everything there's a season, for a time and purpose, for everything under the heavens, a time to be born, a time to die. And it, uh, it Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, gives you this list. So when we talk about turning the other cheek, there's also a season to turn the other cheek, and, it, and it's time not to. Now, who, who taught us to turn the other cheek? It was Jesus. So if you believe that, a believer is also always supposed to, uh, that justice in that situation is what we're talking about is a believer is always supposed to turn the other cheek. Why is it that Jesus didn't always turn the other cheek when he's seen people doing wrong or doing wrong to him? Jesus confronted people verbally. Jesus jumped on people in the temple. Mm -hmm. He jumped on them and ran them out, made a whip, whip of cords. Why didn't Jesus see what they was doing? It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to turn the other cheek. And when we talk about turning the other cheek, what we're talking about is radical control of emotional response. That's what we're at. Radical control of emotional response is, is basically what we're saying when we say turn the other cheek. It isn't just, you know, assault and somebody hitting you. Yeah, it's not what that always is talking about. So I want to give you a full picture from the mind of God as I can in my finite mind anyway. So again, when we talk about that, Jesus didn't always turn the other cheek as well. As a matter of fact, Jesus also just taught his disciples that a time was going to come where they didn't need the other turn the other cheek either. Because remember, there was a time Jesus warned his disciples, said the time going to come when you need to uh, sell your coat and buy a sword. Or today, it would be a gun for us. 
Jesus is always doing it. So I said that to point out is that when we talk about justice, justice uh, isn't necessarily, uh, again, always swinging the battle axe. Justice is also delivering justice and mercy. Justice has to have a component of mercy to it. So again, we found out David David showed that justice, sought out Mephizabeth, blessed Mephizabeth. Mephizabeth ate at his table, although in ancient times we know that oftentimes rulers would kill the entire remaining prodigy, you know, the, 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 the entire lineage of those who were former rivals, so there's no challenges to the throne. David uh, could have had a horrible relationship with Jonathan, but their relationship was closer than he could have had an adversarial relationship because it could be said that Mephizabeth, now that Saul and Jonathan, uh, Mephizabeth's grandfather and father were dead, had some claim to the throne. David could have killed him because of that threat. But again, when we talk about justice, it isn't always swinging the battle axe. A lot of times it's picking somebody up as well as David showed us in this lesson. And we asked the question, who can you show radical kindness to? And the lesson aims there. And again, we could call radical kindness, we could refer it we could refer to radical kindness as grace. We went on to lesson three, which was December 19th, which was just last week, and it was called the source of justice. And we know that God, and what we learned is God is a source of all righteous justice anyway. And the devil is not capable of rendering righteous justice. And we know that m most of 99% of the world systems are built on a faulty system of justice, even us, us here in America. And I know we have these patriot flag waivers, and, and I served in the United States Marine Corps, was injured, you know. So I, I want to, uh, for coming from a, a disabled veteran perspective, I have the authority, and I actually stood on the wall. I can make this statement. Anybody can, but I got extra, right? Uh, to make this statement because I stood on the wall and defended that constitution uh, with a weapon. But I say that to point out that I pointed out to you uh, one of the injustices uh, is the foundation of the American system of justice, which is called the United States Constitution. And, and flag waivers, patriots, these good old boys and good Christians, you know what I'm talking about. I ain't got to say it here. But those people waved their flags talking about the Constitution and their rights and all those other things. But from our perspective, the Constitution was not written, the United States was not written for us. If it was written for us, why would a 13th or 14th Amendment even be necessary? That's the question. So I'm asking those questions simply because the writer of the Constitution, you know, this Bill of Rights, these things, Bill of Rights Constitution, these things began with this. We hold these truths right off the top of my spirit here to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain rights. Among them is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, Thomas Jefferson is the man that wrote those words, but he himself, while he was writing those words, had, a, had slaves on his plantation in Monticello. He was a slave owner. George Washington, who went out during, uh, once, that, once that Bill of Rights was written, it was actually considered treasonous uh, to the crown in England, who was the governing authority of the colonies at the time in 1776, when, or 1775, 1776, around that time, when that treatise was, or that bill was written, uh, was, it was considered uh, treason at that time. So these, and George Washington went out, he's the head of the Continental Co uh, Army. I don't, don't want to give you a history lesson here. Nevertheless, the people who wrote that were not people who even understood what justice was because they had slaves while claiming that all men are endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights or right about them or rights, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness while they deprived those things for our uh, forebearers. So the, the justice system uh, in this world is flawed, but God is the source of all righteous justice, which began, as I explained to you, the first uh, judgment and justice that we see, justice being a result of righteous justice being a result of righteous judgment. And we know that the source of justice, or the first uh, rendering of justice that we found was in Isaiah, obviously, chapter 14, when Lucifer obviously was cast down, woe to the garden, Genesis chapter 3, on and on and on. And we found out also in that lesson, we had a very powerful question about and the what do you think in that lesson? What are some specific and doable ways to celebrate this season with acts of kindness? And I told you, you need to stop trying to do and just start being. Because when I am 
what God, when I am who God said I am and I am walking it out through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to do what's right. But a lot of people are doing right, but they're not being right. What I mean by that is a lot of people do good deeds, are amongst the wickedest people you will ever come across. Major donors, Bill Gates, these sorts of people, they do good deeds, but they, don't, they, are, they have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. People do not have to come out and say they believe in the devil to be working for the devil because Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scattereth abroad. And we know scattering abroad is the work of the devil. We connect another scripture to that, who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So don't think because somebody isn't walking around with red horns on that they're and, and they're doing good deeds that they are of the Lord. The Bible said it is by faith that we are saved. It is a free gift of God and not of works uh, any can boast of. So I send that to point this out is that the greatest thing that you can do, obviously first, and I taught you this some lessons ago, if you, you say, okay, what is the, we ended our praise and worship a series with this was that the greatest act of praise you can give God ain't singing some song, not showing up at church. It's surely it's certainly not even preaching. Mm -hmm. I said it. A pastor preacher said it. The greatest act that anybody can give God is to present themselves. The scripture says as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, blameless, which is your reasonable service. Presenting ourselves has to precede any ministry activity, singing, preaching, and all of those things. Because when I have salvation, I present myself as a living sacrifice. I have, I have poured, the Lord has gotten, poured all of that evil and wickedness out of me. And now righteousness can be poured into me. And how can I know whether I should sing or preach or, or pray or, or intercess, evangelist, whatever that is, if I don't first present myself as a living sacrifice so God can pour his will into my life? Enough of that. So you need to start and start being instead of trying to do. Now, once I'm being, I'm going to do what's righteous. Re remember, I told you, we don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. So salvation and sanctification has to precede the doing. So be saved and be sanctified. And that will lead you to where God would have you to be. And today is lesson four, again, December 26, 2021, unit one, God requires justice, the consequences we're talking about today of justice and a devotional reading is Exodus 34, 1 through 10. And the background scripture is Nahum 1 and the print passage, Nahum 1, 1 through 3, 6 through 8, 12 through 13, and then 15. And the key verse, God is jealous and the Lord revenges, the Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves his wrath for his enemies. So let's first deal with that because, again, that word, and I did... A, apologetics video on biblical jealousy and what jealousy is right. Less, I'm going to drop on Sunday school students today to, to, to tell you something I'm pretty sure that 99.9% .9 of you uh, did not know, is that when we talk about jealousy, would you believe me if I told you one of God's names is jealous? Remember, we Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider, Jehovah Nisi. And, and, and the difference is many of those names people gave God. God didn't give himself. God himself said, my name is jealous, so I am a jealous God. So one of God, Exodus chapter 34, please read it for yourself. I don't want you to say, Dale said something. He said, God, is, you go there and read it for yourself, right? So what we know uh, to a couple of times in the book of Exodus, God uh, said, describe his name and his function. No, Moses said in Exodus, whoso I said, tell the children of Israel sent me. They will say, what is his name. He said, I am that I am. Tell him I am has sent me. And then God went on and said his name was jealous for he is a jealous God. So when we talk about God being jealous, we're talking about righteous jealousy. And when I say righteous jealousy, I meant that burning, that longing, that hostile anger that is directed towards unrighteousness purely because it's an offense to God. Now the the unrighteous kind of jealousy we deal with often is the fear of losing something. I want to tell you something, Saint. Jealousy, I, and I can, I told you, I don't speak on things that I struggle with. I told you that. I will not speak on things and, and tell you, rebuke you, exhort you on things I struggle with. I don't do that because Romans chapter 2 says, O thou man of God, you are inexcusable who judges another and doest the same thing. How will you escape the damnation of God? So I speak to you on jealousy as someone who doesn't struggle with that, and I never really have struggled with jealousy. No, I just don't. That's not something I struggle with. I love to see people doing well. I love to see people financially doing better than me. I love to see God blessing people. I've never met anybody that I, a man, 
Woman, I've never met anybody that I thought was better than me. Never seen anybody on TV that I thought was better than me because I know better, right? Because I know that I'm created in likeness and image of God. Even before I came to the Lord, I was content with who God created me to be. I wasn't content in my sin, but I knew even then that I had purpose. So I don't struggle with that. That is why I speak on this. There's some things that I, in patience and other things that I won't speak to you on because I struggle with them actively, right? But when we talk about jealous, wicked jealousy is fear of losing something. Righteous, righteous jealousy is uh, that jealousy that burns when somebody is trying to assault God's throne. Now, one of the greatest acts, uh, two of the greatest acts of jealousy in the scripture that you have ever, you will ever come across, obviously, is Jesus storming into the temple um, to chase out the money changes. My, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer and you turned it into a den of thieves. That was one of the greatest acts of jealousy in the Bible. Another great act of jealousy was Elijah on Mount Carmel in the Old Testament slaying those false prophets of Jezebel, literally killing them um, because they were trying to assault God's glory. So I want to, in that part of the jail, and we'll go on to lesson aims, but it's, we, we have to unpack this. Uh, saints, we have to be taught, and I have to give you what the Spirit has revealed into my mind. I would consider it robbery if I withheld knowledge from you that uh, the Spirit uh, let me know that you are ready for. The fact is, if anybody has told you, again, that jealousy is wrong, that, again, is a lie from the pit of hell. The question becomes, why are you fearfully jealous instead of being jealous for God's glory? Here's the thing about jealousy. Jealousy, the worldly kind of jealousy, the wicked jealousy, you're afraid of losing something. You're afraid you're not enough. You're afraid of all of these things. First of all, you are created in the likeness and image of God, according to Genesis chapter 2. That's the first thing. The second thing is, why are you jealous of losing something when you don't own anything anyway? You own absolutely nothing. I know you think you do. I know you do. Let me, let me explain myself because we have to grab this before I go on here. When we talk about fear, what do you really have uh, to lose? Now, I'm not speak. I'm talking about you as a saint. I ain't talking necessarily. We ain't gonna go forward to your soul, and I'm not going there. But I'm talking about tangible things. What do you really have to lose? You, you what? I, I got a house. I paid my house off. Uh, that's my house. You sure about that? In America, are in? Are you sure? Unless you are a 100% disabled veteran in the state or county you live in, grant you 100% exemptions from property taxes, which there are very few of you that could say that. If you have to pay taxes on a house, you can still lose your house by not paying your taxes. If, if you are ever at a point where somebody can remove something from you and you can do nothing about it, you don't own that. You don't, because if you don't do something further, it can be removed. And I'm talking about owning something that can't be taken away from you right? Car. Don't pay the tags on your car. See what happens. That car becomes useless because you'll come driving on the street and you'll get so many tickets and when cops going to stop you, that car will be towed at some point. You'll have so many tickets. So do you have anything? Why are you jealous? The point is, why are you jealous of something that you don't own? The, you, we quote the scripture. I quote the scripture about God owning the cattle on a thousand hills. We quote that scripture that says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. We quote that scripture in John chapter 1 that says all things were created by him and for him which means Jesus owns these things, and while without him was not anything made that was made. How can we quote that scriptures and possess, an, uh, possess a fear of losing something that, does, that belongs to God anyway? This is how crazy it is, and I can move on here. So why would you worry about somebody coming to reclaim property that doesn't belong to you anyway? So jealousy is nonsensical because you don't really own anything anyway. The one thing you do own, and this goes to our everlasting choices, is your choices. You own those and you're going to answer for those in front of God. And the lesson name, study how God delivers justice through the prophecy of Nahum. Experience hope through the belief that God's justice will prevail. Identify ways to serve those who have not been treated justly. In the introduction, this writer vividly remembers a sermon delivered by the late Reverend Jerome Rayner entitled, How Long? His exposition focused on the continuing violence and unrighteousness that characterizes nation and the world at the time. He dramatically posed this question and subject to challenge and awaken the church to confront the evils of society and his slackness in modeling Christ-likeness at the solution. How long? How long is a question anyway? 
on the lips of the hearts of people experiencing unjust treatment. Certainly, it is a question that is raised by earlier generations, obviously, of African Americans as they suffer some of the worst forms of inhumane treatment. Today, we pose this question amid upsurges of blatant racism and continuing moral degradation to our community and nation. And, and I'll end there. And I, the world does what the world does. Y'all know my mission in life, and I've told you Sunday school students, my mission in life is what goes on in the house of God. My, God sent me two leaders uh, to, to bring them to him, to call them back to him. That is my mission in life, right? Yes, I'm pastor and I'm leading his sheep and I'm doing those things as well. So, but at the same time, you know, one of the things that we learned from the apostle Paul is Paul oftentimes was not, read his epistles. When he writ, wrote to the churches, he, would, he, he wasn't really concerned about what was going on outside. He was concerned about the behavior within the church. Paul didn't spend a lot of times crying out on the wicked world. He spent a lot of time in his epistles dealing with the wickedness in the church. So with that said, a lot of times we're focusing on what's going on outside and trying to correct that as believers when what we should be doing is asking God and pleading with God how long is the corruption and the wickedness going on in your house going to go on? And that was the job of biblical prophets, right? Nations, other nations had seers. They had all of these other things. But did you notice that only Israel had prophets? And one, one of the issues with that was God sent prophets to his people. And yes, he cry, prophets cried out certainly on wicked nations, but prophets cried out on wicked nations in relations to God's people. So when we talk about how long, God, yes, we can say, how long, God, do we have to suffer the things that the world throws on us? But saints, again, we remember we talked about unrighteous judgment. Remember I, the opening, I gave a 13, go back to lesson one. Your dear servant presented you the biblical case for why judgment is a good thing and not a bad thing as teachers and preachers have told you and Sunday school teachers and even well-meaning people. That, that's, that's not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Remember, one of the main points that we talked about was unrighteous judgment, right? Unrighteous judgment is the judgment that Jesus was warning against and Paul was warning against and God was warning against. It was not righteous judgment, which he gives us. And I gave the biblical exposition. I don't have to go through that again. Are you... Are God's people and me, and uh, these are one, I'm not trying to soften the blow. Y'all know I don't do that, but this is one of those times where I'm challenged very few times in front of you that I'm challenging myself as well. Not trying to soften the blow. I don't do that, but it's appropriate this time. Are we as God's people looking, talking about racism in the world and social injustice in the world, and there's injustices right in the houses that we inhabit? So what we are saying is it's bad for inequity to go on outside of the house of God, but it goes on inside of the house of God all the time. We are just, we are adjusting, uh, addressing what goes on outside, but not within. And the, the question becomes, uh, someone said it uh, best in an old song, sweep around your back door before you go sweep it around somebody else's. It's hypocritical for us to look at what our, these people outside of the body are doing and say it's wicked when we don't address the wickedness within the church. For instance, and I'll move on here and then go on to our analysis of the biblical text, but I got to take time with this. When we talk about this and we're talking about a jealous God here, when we talk about that, we address the sexual sins in the world, for instance. Oh, we got this uh, stuff going on like these transgenders, these same-sex marriages. We, we, the world says, oh, that's wickedness. Oh, man, preachers want to preach about that. But what about the sexual sins that are going on inside of the house of God? Is my Why are we so jealous of God's glory outside of the house of God when we look without and we're not jealous for his glory inside the house of God? And, but in the house of God, we have, again, sexual sins going on. We have people that are shacked up. We know it's going on. No intentions being married. We don't address it. And we have uh, people, church leaders uh, as well. And we have congregants, church leaders, auxiliary leaders that are living in sexual sin. And we say nothing about it. And we don't address it. We don't deal with those people biblically. But we want to talk about the sexual sins of transgenderism and little boys taking their little girls and little girls taking their little boys outside of the house of God.
Saints, that makes God's, that makes God jealous for his glory when we do things and when we're not equitable because we are also talking about, uh, in our last lesson, we're talking about social justice. So how are we addressing without and not addressing within? How are we telling somebody else? So how are we saying, ooh, you know, one of the big things when I was a kid, one of the worst things you could say about somebody is not their kid. You know, their son's in jail or their daughter on the street doing what they That ain't one of the worst things. One of the worst things you could say about somebody when I was growing up was, you know, they got roaches. <laughs> you know, they got roaches. So we're saying other people outside the house of God have roaches, but there's no roaches in the house of God. And saints, that is not equitable. That is not godly justice, which is the topic of these whole Sunday school lessons. And that doesn't show God's justice in a righteous manner. So let's deal with what's going on in the house and then step outside the house and deal with what's going on, what's going on out there. Amen. A jealous God, analysis of the biblical text, uh, Nahum 1, 1, 2, 3. The burden of Nineveh, the book of vision, Nahum the Ichalite. God is jealous and the Lord revenges, the Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord will, is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. That's from without the house and within the house. This is from without the nation of Israel as well as within the nation of Israel because we know that huge scene of those people that were in within the, the children of Israel. Along the, this text happened here. And we know that they were worshiping uh, for false God at the face of the mountain that Moses wanted to get Ten Commandments. And God killed, killed 3,000. I think he said 3,000 of them died in the camp that day. So don't think God's going to avenge his uh, deal with, the, with the, his enemies outside and that he's not going to come to the house. Because the Bible clearly tells us that judgment begins where? At the house of God. Amen. And the description. Nahum's prophecy has, has been identified as a sequel to Jonah. Jonah had preached a, a message of repentance with positive results. A century later, however, the inhabitants of Nineveh returned to their evil, but with more arrogance and ruthlessness. The northern kingdom of Israel had been uh, conquered and scattered. In Nahum's time, Judah, the southern kingdom, was a harassed vassal of Assyria. Nahum's message was the impending punishment of Assyria and of the comfort of Judah as a result. He explained that God would not allow evil to reign without its experience in his righteous judgment. Nahum introduces his prophecy as a burden on an oracle against Nineveh. An oracle is a message directly from God that foretells disaster and destruction in the case of Nineveh. Nahum is God's chosen messenger. In poetic form, Nahum describes God's unchanging character as a basis for his wrath against those opposing him and his people. And again, even his, his people have opposed him. And you know how I know that? How, why did Israel in the Old Testament end up in Babylon as captives? because they were God's enemies and they opposed God. God is jealous, literally zealous or passionate about the welfare of those in covenant relationship with him. He selflessly looks out for his people and vengeance all injustices that attack his character and harm them. God's jealous anger is long suffering, tempered with patient mercy, but does not allow evil to go unpunished. God had given uh, the Ninevites the span of an entire century to repent. Now they would experience his wrath. Nahum's prediction was a message of hope for Judah and a good news for recent believers. What do you think? How can a message of judgment also be one of comfort and hope? The scripture that says, whom he loves, he chastises. So a message of chastisement is actually a comfort and hope because I know this is happening because God loves me. You know, my mama, she got me, you know, and switches, braided switches sometimes did what she did because she loved me and she wanted to keep me safe. Remember, we opened this entire series with teaching that justice protects, judgment precedes judge, justice. And God's judgment and justice protects us from wickedness 
evils, and ultimately an eternity apart from him. And back to the analysis of the biblical text, no escape, Nahum 1, 3b, 6 through 8. And 3b says, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. And verse 6 says, who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a strong hold in the day of troubles, and he knoweth them that trust in him, but with an overrunning flood he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. In the description, the futile hope of escape of God's wrath against Nineveh depicts the greatness of God's power. Nahum describes it and God's ability to punish Nineveh by emphasizing his control over nature. Nahum compares the impending destruction of Nineveh to whirlwinds and storms God causes in nature. The power he uses to reverse and alter the natural world was still available to punish Nineveh for her rebellion with him. Nahum's conclusion was that none can or will escape his punishment for evil because of his promise of power and his holy character. And remember, there are even people uh, at the time of judgment that all of us are going to experience. Jesus said, Some, when are you going to come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these wonderful works in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. There are people as well as those outside that, are, that think that they're serving in God and are actually serving witness. And Jesus is going to say, get from me, depart from me. What do you think? What are some of the specific ways that our efforts to promote justice and evangelism should be affected by the certainty of God's judgment? Saints, you have to be resolute in, in what you learned in God's word. And mostly, again, we're back to this. We promote by our lifestyles. And for those of you, God has set apart to cry out judgment, um, violence, and spoil. I'm specifically uh, preaching to prophets here is that there's some specific, uh, the way that you promote justice and integrity in the house of God in judgment is being who God calls you to be, even though um, those that lead his people locally, shepherds, are going to reject your message. They're going to reject your message. They they just can't help themselves. Most of them, they just can't. And I'm not going to even go there today. Most of them, they just can't help it. So the way that you do that is to is to be who God calls you to be. Now, it says evangelism as well. And evangelists, you be who God calls you to be in that. You can't just reach out um, and bring people to God without necessarily assuring their safety in God. You have to know the house of God is safe that you send them to. You are not only bringing them into the kingdom of God, but you are to get them to a safe house. You know, there's this thing that uh, these these ministries in Denver, Colorado, where I used to come from for abuse of women and children, and those women would come to these places and to get out of abusive marriages and relationships and to protect their children, and they were called safe houses. So what I'm saying today is even evangelists, you have to make sure you are doing more than just bringing them to the Lord. You have to get them to a safe house and not some of these dens of Satan and these dens of iniquity where when these new converts walk in and are largely ignorant of God's word but not his goodness, that these sharp, these sharp teeth wolves, these false shepherds are going to feast on them. Don't Send them just anywhere, assuming that they're going to be safe evangelists. Condemnation and vindication. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet shall they be cut down when they pass through. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict thee no more. For now I will break his yoke off of you, and I will burst the bonds of thunder. Now God afflicted these people because a lot of times, as I said, the Old Testament, God would send these his people into bondage or put them into a situation where they were overran by enemies. But God is so good that even when they're enemies, he allowed their enemies to uh, overrun them because of their wickedness. God came back and dealt with the enemies for running over his people. <laughs> He is faithful, faithful. 15, but behold the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace. O oh, Judah, keep your solemn feast, perform your vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through. The, he has utterly cut off. The Bible says, uh, uh, how, 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 how beautiful are the feet of them that preach on the mountain, 
the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Even when people are coming down on me and pointing fingers and coming at me for teaching righteousness, I'm so comforted in the fact that God thinks my, and knows anyway, and anointed and said that my feet are beautiful on the mountains. <laughs> merciful Jesus, merciful, merciful Jesus. And what do you think finally? Why did, is Nahum's message relevant to address the injustice and, inhum, inhum, and inhumane conditions that exist today? Injustice is injustice. Dr. King said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this lesson of your justice. Lord, thank you, Lord, for reaching out to those without, uh, Lord, that are not with your people yet, and as well as dealing with your people, Lord, in mercy and justice within the body. Father, let us be bold in our witnesses, but just in our witnesses to clean up our own houses, Lord, before we tell somebody else to clean up theirs. Father, we know that your mercy is undeserved. We know that your grace is undeserved, Lord, but you Bless us with it anyway. Thank you, Lord. And until next time, in Jesus' name, amen, and so be it.